If you want to start a mob, get a woman and a child. All throughout history, in a very Freudian way, everything men have done for power links back to sex. The easiest way to scare people into control is to assert the idea of a sexual threat or barrier to sexual reproduction. We can see this particular outrage tactic being used on minority groups in accounts of lynchings and even medieval witch hunts. Once you instill the fear of sexual threat, preference difference or predation in a group, it makes it easier to dehumanize your target and to paint them as a monster or other. Even though it doesn't have to be true it just needs to tug the emotionality and the morality of the intended mob if i was a white woman i would rob black dudes <laughs> i walk up to black guys and be like hi my name is sarah give me your wallet <laughs> sarah that's my grandma's name give me your wallet i'm gonna scream here, here sarah you don't need to get the cops involved take it <laughs> <laughs> Look at some of the white women like, wow, we could actually do that. <laughs> For instance, the coining of a term like super predator was an intentional act and the irony is it didn't have anything to do with sex offenders. But the word predator indicates the possibility of criminals leaning in a sexual direction. The use of that term allowed for mass targeting and incarceration of minorities in America, seeing them handed ridiculous sentences for non-violent or sexual crimes. Put simply, once you propagandize enough through media, you remove the chances of your target ever receiving a fair unbiased trial by judge and jury because in their mind, Minds, they associate this character with a predator. We just want to live separate from the other races, just like the Bible attended. You know, that's one of the things a preacher showed me a long time ago. He was was at a Klan rally, and I recognized a lot of the Klan. A lot of Klan rallies had a lot of preachers there, and you know, and he showed me the Bible verse Leviticus 19:18, because you always hear people holler, "Love thy neighbor," but then when you read the verse for yourself, it says, "Love thy neighbor of thy people." And the Klan is a Christian organization. Yes, a Christian organization. We read the same Bible everybody else does. We just actually read all of the Bible instead of skip through like these uh, Judeo-Christian preachers do today. We use the Bible to swear you in to become a full-fledged member of the clan. I mean, we just want to stick by the laws of God. And, you know, you ain't going to make it to the kingdom of heaven unless you stick by the laws of God. So that's one thing we try to teach in our family. You know, this was taught 30, 40 years ago. I remember, you know, you wouldn't see colored people mixing and going into a church 30 years ago, not in this state. And now the preachers are allowed. And to me, it's sickening. And it's sickening to see these preachers sell out their congregations and damn their own congregation straight to hell by pushing all this equality nonsense, knowing that the Bible says all the races should be separate. And that when Christ comes back, he says he shall separate all races again, separate all people by their tongues and put them in their own nations. That's in Matthew. 15. So, I mean, to me, the Bible and the Klan go hand in hand. The fear of other is something that is both innately built into humans, but predominantly manipulated by those who seek to control and sway public opinion. You might say, what has this got to do with atheists and theists? Tactics like propaganda and rhetoric are used to dehumanize a group of people in order for the dominantly volatile group to disassociate from the persecution and violence they enact on their targets. I foresee an argument being made in the near future that modern religions are moving towards the subjugation and discrimination of atheists and non-believers as religions themselves move into the position of the largest dominant groups on the planet, specifically in third world countries. The use of propaganda is like an effective soft kill tactic when destabilizing a country and is exasperated when igniting a breakdown in the moral fabric of society by creating fear of the other. Well, if you're wondering what does that actually look like, need I point to one of the most obvious conflicts in the world that is still going on in 2024. I'm often asked, and occasionally in an accusatory way. Are you atheist? You know, the only ist I am is a scientist, right? I don't associate with movements. I don't, I'm not an ism. I, I just, I, I think for myself. The moment once someone attaches you to a philosophy or a movement, then they assign all the baggage and all the rest of the philosophy that goes with it to you. And when you want to have a conversation, they will assert that they already know everything important there is to know about you because of that association. And that's not the way to have a conversation. I'm sorry, it's not. That aside, the case of Mubarak Bala being convicted for blasphemy against Islam and receiving a 20 plus year sentence is clear evidence for the notion that once you propagandize enough, you can almost pull off any level of dehumanization and encroachment of rights, even in the 2020s. Mubarak Bala is an outspoken atheist from Kano, a conservative state in the northern part of Nigeria. He frequently shared his beliefs on social media and later became president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria. I'm a critic of religion. People take it as an insult. 
but I don't see it as an insult or blasphemy. If they feel hurt that this is what I'm doing, they can actually just unfriend me. They don't need to follow it. Mubarak's forthright criticism of Islam and religion in general caused outrage among conservatives in the country, and after Muslim lawyers in Kano complained to the police, he was arrested in April 2020. Initially, it was difficult to even get them to admit that they had it. What followed is a landmark case that has placed the threats to freedom of religion and expression in Nigeria under new scrutiny and that ended with a sentencing that sent shockwaves around the world. He was arrested because he was accused of making blasphemous posts on Facebook. I asked him, why are you doing this? He sighed and I was like, I mean, I have so many reasons for being what I am today. People use religion to cover up their evil. Whether you're Muslim, whether you're Christian, whatever. They use religion to steal. They use religion to kill. They use religion to bully. They use religion to for power. He said, I mean, I cannot pretend about this. I have had this in my mind for so, so long. I cannot keep quiet again. SS Umar accused Mubarak of insulting religion with the intent of causing a breach to the peace under Section 210 of the Kano State Penal Code. It was public knowledge at this point that Mubarak was no longer a Muslim. How much more difficult and perhaps dangerous is it for you as a Muslim to declare that you don't have faith anymore? Had he been, he would have been tried under Islamic law and would have faced the death penalty, as blasphemy is a capital offence. I was accused of committing blasphemy. Once you're accused of blasphemy, that means you've committed treason. Around 3 a.m. I discovered that my house was on fire. I had to leave with only my phone and nothing else. So they burned down your house? Yes, yes. Since Mubarak Bala was jailed, his arrest created a kind of panic amongst ex-Muslims in northern Nigeria. Nearly all of us, there are lots of us who decided to disengage from social media activities because, you know, the emotion and outrage was so high that once people discover that you are not a Muslim, you are poised to be a target. Mubarak was arrested in April 2020, but wasn't able to see his lawyers until October that year. It took almost two years before he was arraigned or formally brought before the court to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. If Murak is convicted, it will be um, a slap to the claim of religious freedom in Nigeria. And if he's acquitted, it will be a victory and a strong signal that uh, there's hope in the campaign to separate religion from state politics. Mubarak pled guilty, but what came next in court was even more astonishing. The judge pronounced a sentence that no one was expecting. Yeah, he was sentenced to 24 years imprisonment. He pleaded guilty uh, for all the count charges, the 18 count charges. The UN have renounced that particular act of human rights violation and called for his release. But personally, I don't think that will make a difference, especially when you're arguing against Islamic beliefs in a majority Muslim place. Secondly, as for poorly prescribed morality, do you think it should be right for a prominent African country to still be openly persecuting homosexuality under the guise of pushing back against historic colonization rather than address the far more recent phenomena in human history like the discriminatory doctrine imparted to them by the colonizers who, by the way, spent a large part of their occupational history sexually abusing men and boys. Oh, okay, so God didn't have anything to do with slavery. No. Right? Right. And that was all on men? Yes, influenced by evil. Okay, but if God, he, he's an all-knowing God, correct? Yes. So he knows that slavery is going on, but yet he fails to intercede or to stop it. You know, we're all God's children, supposedly. Why come he couldn't say, those children need to let those children go? Well, we're not all God's children. Some, some, not, some people are children? children of Satan. Such okay. as yourself. So what about the Islam Islamic people? Is, is that the same God as the God you worship? No. No, it's a different no, God? It's a different God. So, wanna, so the, out of the million people that study Islam, their religion is bad because his God isn't equal to your God? The God that created us all, created us, us all, is a God of all love all the time. Apparently the Islamic or Muslim God is not. An excellent example of propaganda use in the dehumanization process would be the possibly staged interview between Jesse Lee Peterson and a black man which the video title claims is an atheist. In the video, he takes up the position in viral soundbite fashion that there is no God, but there is a devil, which is a bizarre, perhaps sarcastic take. So your brain that causes your body to function has a voice to you and it directs you with words about more values or about values. Correct. And right. your brain create your brain's created this voice. Correct. That's it's amazing. It sounds, it sounds amazingly just like my voice. It sounds like yours? Yeah, it sounds just like my voice. Do you believe there's evil or the devil? Do I believe there's a devil? I know you don't believe there's a God. Do you believe there's a Satan? Yes, of course there's a Satan. So why do you believe there's a Satan but not a God? Because Satan is real. Evil is real. But good is not? No. Good is not real? No. But evil is real? Correct. And are you a good man or an evil man? I'm a good man. How are you good if you're not getting your, good from, your goodness from God? Because I don't believe in God. But how are you good then? I get my, my goodness from Satan. But you just said Satan is evil. Okay. He's not evil all the time. As Jesse walks him down a rabbit hole of lunacy, you see how easily he falls into the interviewer's trap and gets backed up against a wall of mental illness diagnosis rather than articulating the cogent processing of his position towards theism. Ultimately, he becomes a false representation of an atheist and a tool of religious nationalist propaganda. Okay, okay, I give up. You tried to kill Aquaman, why? Gee, 
Why would a hired gun try to shoot somebody? Could it be that someone paid me to? Why wouldn't God circumvent the need to have a children's cancer ward is, if he had the power to change it? Is cancer evil or good? Cancer is it's evil, of course. So your God created cancer then? So my God created cancer. Because your God is evil, right? Yes, of course. So, so, he, so sure, so cancer must have why not get a credit to your God for creating cancer? Because you said it is evil, your God is evil. Why did he create that? I can't understand. I have no idea. He won't tell you why? No, but but now, now do you what? communicate with Satan? Never. Do never. you pray to Satan? Only twice a week. Do you pray to him? Mm -hmm. And when you pray to him, what do you say? I, I pray that we get out of this evil, evil world that we call life. If God was so omnipotent and strict, why wouldn't he get rid of the devil? He'd get rid of him. So why does he still exist? Because he needs to exist for a while longer. If you black of skin and full of sin, come forward so I may lay my hands on you. Oh, ah, thank you Jesus. Black, be gone. Ah, praise white Jesus. So, black people are a cursed, cursed, cursed. Although I'm generalizing when I say that religious people still think of themselves as the persecuted minority, they do for the most part take up the role of Jesus against the Jews or the position of Jews against the Pharaoh. But the reality is religions have billions of members and are growing daily and have done for thousands of years. In addition, the big three religions are widely accepted and well integrated into every layer of society from politics to education. This dominant position in the mainstream culture and media makes it difficult for a non-believer to voice their concerns concerns about propaganda or a believer to voice their doubts out of fear of falling on the wrong side of history or go into hell. I was going to ask, in terms of, of dealing with moral issues and so forth, what source or, or, or what uh, uh, authority do you tend to, to get your moral beliefs and, and uh, so forth from? It doesn't take much. Common sense. We know what it takes to be a good citizen in this society. We already have secular laws to tell us that. But then those, most of those secular laws grow out of uh, religious uh, doctrines? Those are the laws we must nullify. Those laws that say that, that want to regulate human relationships ought to be nullified. Laws that demand we take oaths to a higher authority don't allow for a pluralistic society. That's the, that's the whole point of separation of state and church, to allow for individuals to live according to law and still keep their various different beliefs. This psychological gag makes for an authoritarian cult-like shackle on the liberty and freedoms of outsiders to the group and a powerful tool used for silencing adverse views from within the dominant group. Some religious people immediately see anyone who doesn't believe what they do as an enemy and even working for the devil. Regardless of how obviously incorrect this line of thinking is, it doesn't change the fact that it is most religious people's point of view and line of reasoning. Again, when I say most, it's a generalization. An additional humorous argument debunked so many times by some of the most prominent voices in the atheist space is the idea that morality requires the existence of a god and a religion, which theists often use to support claims of their necessity without a simple thought given to something like natural selection, survival, or the human ability to make use of mirror neurons when interacting with others. Um, I recall uh, James Henry Breasted, who was a famous American Egyptologist um, at the University of Chicago, established the Oriental Institute in, I think, about 1935. James Henry Breasted uh, got in trouble for saying that the Ten Commandments were derived from the 42 admonitions of Ma'at. What does that mean? Ma'at in ancient Kemet was the overriding force that governed everything in the universe. She represented the principles of, of justice, balance, harmony, and that there were 42 admonitions of Ma'at. Some of them were, I have not stolen, I have not robbed, I have not defrauded offerings, I have not polluted myself, I have not polluted the land, I have not committed um, uh, adultery, uh, I have not spoken ill against God. And so it is from the 42 admonitions of Ma'at that Moses derived the Ten Commandments. And so there is a profound difference between an admonition of Ma'at where one declares your innocence and says, I have not done X, Y, and Z, and a commandment where people without a profound understanding of Ma'at must be commanded not to do things that a person in their right mind would know not to do. So, so these are cultural differences that are based upon another culture uh, appropriating aspects of African culture and interpreting it through their own cultural lens. Kenya is about uh, 85 to 90 percent religious. Any typical Kenya will have to probably go through a religious upbringing. Being an atheist in Kenya is not easy at all. Now, what prompted me to form the Atheist in Kenya Society is I, I strongly believe that we have like-minded Kenyans but they do not have a platform. Uh, when we applied for the registration of the Atheist in Kenya Society, the registrar refused to register the society until we piled pressure on her to actually do it. We were actually suspended by the government in 2016 and we had to move to court and we won the case court against the government. But I think, you know, the, the, the thing which we are seeing is this idea that there is something wrong with us not believing in God. I think we need to really kill that mentality so that you as a human being and me, we are human, but our differences, we do respect them. Under the Kenyan law, discrimination is, is illegal. Uh, however, in real life, atheists face uh, discrimination, uh, various forms of discrimination in their employment, in their family spaces. We are seen as devil worshippers. We are seen as people without morals. 
we are seen as people who cannot differentiate right from wrong. A funny remark I often think of is if religion works and religious people are vastly righteous, moral and law abiding, why is it that almost every prison in the world is full of religious people or nearly every war or genocide fought done by religious people? Although I find that humorous, it does slightly misrepresent a lot of the argument and it is fallacious. With the example of what I just said in mind, a lot of the time fallacies and misconceptions are used to justify oppositional stances against non-believers and believers alike. People who use conjecture and ad hominem tactics are usually not people very well read on their own particular doctrine and are usually quickly riled up. Have a relationship with God. You sit up here talking to a dude, he tells you he's an atheist, you need to pack it up and go home. You, know, you talk to God, you finish, you finish. What's his moral barometer? Where is it at? It's nowhere. When we were in Egypt, you mentioned that the 10 commandments that we are aware of are derived from 42 commandments that carry another name, the negative confessions. Or admonitions to Goddess Ma'at. I see. And they're, they're thousands of years older than the so-called Ten Commandments, you see. Speaking of God, you say in the book that uh, you wouldn't go out with a woman, I guess a woman should not go out with a man who doesn't believe in God. No, I mean, why would well, you? Well, do you believe that only people who are religious are ethical and moral? No, I just believe if you don't believe in God, then where's your moral barometer? That's just me talking. I you understand, can believe what yeah. you want to believe, yeah. but if, if you're an atheist, you're basing your goodness and morality on what? The right social and moral development of mankind in the Nile Valley, which is 3,000 years older than that of the Hebrews, contributed essentially to the formation of Hebrew literature. Our moral heritage therefore derives from a wider human past enormously older than the Hebrews. I mean, but what is an atheist? I don't, I don't really get into that. You know what? I've talked to people all the time. I'm an atheist. I just walk away. I don't, I don't know what to say to you. God is real, man. Where you think all this stuff come from? How you think this world got formed? How you really think that's cloud formation? Where you think the waterfall come from? I flunked out of school. I had a severe stuttering problem. I couldn't talk outside my house. I'm on my third marriage. I lost everything I ever owned twice. I've been homeless and lived in the car for three years. You can't tell me nothing. Based on the small amount of research I've done in the most modest way possible, I've found that believers who have thoroughly examined their religions and religious texts tend to be a lot less hostile in debates and are more likely to find agreeable points and discrepancies in common with atheists, regardless of their belief difference. But like you said, I mean, there is this new wave and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that on the one hand, um, I say all the time, man, you really can't deal with the problem of evil within the context of the African-American um, experience, you know, without in some way butting up against racism, oppression, and, you know, addressing those kinds of, of suffering. And unfortunately, I think in many ways, the, you know, the church hasn't spent a lot of time, you know, uh, cultivating responses to the problem of evil that are relevant directly to the kinds of sufferings that people in the Black atheist community are most concerned about. And so now what you have is this community, like you said, of atheists who have all the same types of objections uh, to Christianity that a Richard, Richard Dawkins would or something like that. But then there's this extra layering of concerns that are really cultivated from these types of cultural, um, you know, uh, sufferings, if you will, you know, that thing really adds a flavor, a kind of black flavor <laughs> yeah. to, the, to the general type of atheism that we encounter. Although ultimately someone has to be right, rather than agreeing to disagree, some people on both sides of the matter have taken up anti-positions where they actively engage in the indoctrination of third parties alongside the active deconstruction of each other's views. Not believing in a set of beliefs doesn't automatically make you against someone else's beliefs. Being an atheist isn't the same as being an anti-theist, but unfortunately it's widely believed that the theist position automatically condemns the atheist position and actively attempts to subvert or convert it. Although some people who become disillusioned with religion tend to find themselves angered by their experience and actively antagonize theists, they do not represent the quiet majority of deconverts and non-believers. It can also be said that theists go out of their way to antagonize atheists and in some places this in-group out-group dynamic escalates to both violent and deviant crimes, but the culprits do not represent the quiet majority of believers. Stepping back to get a bigger view of the picture, the amount of visible religion religious groups and believers dwarf the vocal atheists you can find online and on the streets and the ratio of atheists to believers in the average family heavily weighs against the atheists even if the beliefs are used as a social bonding tool rather than regarded with steadfast conviction. My name is Andre. I'm an atheist and like so many others I happen to be the only atheist in my family. 
But why is being a black atheist so much different? Why does it seem that belief in God in black America is seen as mandatory? My family always knew that I was an atheist, but I never really asked them how they felt about it until now. My family, my extended family, to me, to, to them, the fact that I don't go to church every Sunday to them feels probably like atheism. Like they don't, it's just not a concept that you would have your own belief system that you would not just subscribe and just fall in. I sometimes feel like the black community has a tendency to be a bit more closed-minded, especially when it comes to religion. I think a big part of that is that, um, you know, that's something that kind of held us together when times were hard. You could say people that identify as atheists by definition and not the organized club with the logo are a minority group. And this isn't including what is considered the secular or Gentile masses who identify with no religion. On Unfortunately, there are cases of open atheists being attacked either verbally or physically based on their non-belief and they are typically shunned or bullied from a young age, especially in ethnic groups. But to be fair, a religious person can argue the same thing happens to them in some circumstances and has historically. A matter of great concern is that within religious groups there is a fear of ostracizing and alienation and it's why many individuals who have doubts in their beliefs find it difficult to voice their concerns in addition to peer pressure and fear of religious consequences of doubt like hell and damnation. Is this heaven? Oh not just heaven ruckus, white heaven. You see there are many different types of people ruckus so God created many separate but well for the most part equal heavens. You don't say. White heaven is for decent, good, God-fearing Christians who just happen to, well, hate everyone and everything relating to black people. That means no Muhammad Ali, no hip-hop music, and no fucking Jesse Jackson. What about Whoopi Goldberg? Nope. Oh, this is heaven. Turns out that God really doesn't have that much of a problem with racism. He doesn't even remember slavery, except in February. Personally, I hate black people ruckus. That's why I did everything I could to make their lives miserable. To hold someone against their will physically is one matter, but to psychologically enslave them is a far harder crime to punish. Historically we have seen it can be quite scary to see how a mob mentality can quickly control a group of supposedly peaceful people, especially when it comes to their beliefs. Through the use of tactics like dehumanization and outrage, it's not hard to envision some of the horrors of racial and religious genocides being enacted under the guise of protecting religious sanctity and purity on future non-believers. Historically, there have been evangelists and crusaders in a race to rule or save the world who made it their business to convert or kill innocent people minding their business all over the planet, some by persuasion and some by force, as they, the crusaders themselves, were propagandized by men who sought power through controlling and monopolizing the path to truth and God. For many enslaved Africans, this would have been the first time they were exposed to the Bible. A Bible selectively edited to instill obedience, using religion to underpin the horror of slavery. A normal King James Version has 1189 chapters in it. Uh, the slave Bible has only 232. Missing are chapters and verses that might have encouraged uprisings. Book of Exodus, redacted. No story of Moses demanding Pharaoh, let my people go. Gone is Galatians. In the verse, there is neither bond nor free, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And no Jeremiah. Woe unto him that useth his neighbor's service without wages. What they've left in are verses such as Ephesians 6.5, which is the famous verse, slaves be obedient to your master. This video is sponsored by the Culture Crack Spring Store. To access the store, all you need to do is click the link in the description or head over to YouTube in the search bar, type at Culture Crack, all one word, go to the main channel, go over to the tab that says store, and then you have access to all the goodies available to you. And don't forget, please like, share, and subscribe.